My name is Jack O'Brien. I'm the editor in chief of Cracked, and joining me on stage, a writer and editor for Cracked Video, one of the two Kurt Vonna guys, Mr. Michael Sway! Hiya, hiya, hiya. The head of Cracked Video, the legs that just won't quit, Mr. Daniel O'Brien! Uh, legs that just won't quit? Is that, is that my name? That just okay. won't quit? The rest of you has been laid off. I'm sorry to inform oh, no. you. <laughs> And joining us this week, a professor of marketing and psychology at the University of Colorado at Boulder. He regularly appears on the BBC and Wired and the WSJ, which I believe is the Wall Street Journal. Please welcome Dr. Peter McGraw. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Today we're talking about the 20 greatest nut shots in movie history. <laughs> Let's roll that reel. <laughs> uh, no, we're talking about psychology, ah. obviously. I feel like it's the thing that we make the most bullshit assumptions about just in our daily lives. And I think most of our information comes from common sense, BuzzFeed quizzes. The Jacker is right about our general uh, willingness to accept almost, like, if I see any movie or TV show where someone says, according to psychology, this is what you're supposed to do now. I believe that. I unconditionally believe it. Yeah, I think most of what I know is The Sopranos and Frasier. How much of your education is Frasier-based? Uh, like 1%, yeah. actually, yeah. Yeah, I think it's so appealing because we all want to know not only why we do what, like, I often look myself in the mirror and go, like, what the hell are you doing, man? What are you, why are you Aww, doing any buddy. of the things you're doing? <laughs> And I assume you all do that every morning and night as well. I, I do. I also wonder why you're doing what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What the f*** is Michael what doing? What the f*** is he doing, buddy? One of the big ones that I wanted to kick things off with is uh, how memory works. In movies, memory just tends to be like a slightly grainy black and white version of exactly what happened. And then you can like access details of what happened by getting hit on the head or, you know, having somebody tell Jason Bourne the right sentence. Right. It's, 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 shows, it's been normalized by shows like House and Monk and Psych where someone is trying to remember something and then they're just like, remember harder. And then it goes into black and white and he's like, oh, that's right. There was this mouse on the floor that was like holding up a sign that said, I'm guilty. I've never seen Monk. <laughs> I assume that's what it's like. Well, then how'd like, you just but, spoil the finale? But, but at that point, they're like, <laughs> Peter, you must know something about, like, the fallibility of, let's say, eyewitness testimony or just the fallibility of memory in general. And I think it's pretty shocking for people who haven't heard how fallible the human memory is. It, it's terrifying, actually, yeah. Like, the, well, the, I, the notion that we rely on eyewitnesses, the fact that we haven't changed the system knowing what we know ab about how... In how much you can influence a, a witness and how much they want to remember. They're not comfortable saying, I don't remember. And so they essentially do their best to recreate things. But they don't, they don't know they're doing that. So that, that's the tricky thing is that we think we can do the thing they do in yeah, the movies right. where you're like, oh yeah, okay, now I have that detail. But you're just f***ing making that up. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not random, right? The, the idea is that there are, these are sort of plausible memories, right? So they're built on scripts, they're built on prior knowledge. There's, um, and, and, and as I said, they can be suggestible. Like, so so um, Elizabeth Loftus, who's done, I think, some of the best work in this, in this area, shows how kind of easy it is to plant memories yeah. into, into people's mind. And, and even just describing a situation with a different word, you know, when the two cars hit, versus crashed changes the details of what people actually recall seeing broken glass on the ground and and so on in this way just as a shout out i'll shout out uh darren brown who's like a hypnotist slash magician and so much of hypnotism i feel like was people fumbling around and stumbling upon all these like ways to hotwire the memory programs and rather than studying it and becoming the branch of like knowledge that we call psychology there's a subset of people who are like i'll just with people yeah. with this <laughs> things we figured out I, and yeah just any video with Darren Brown there's a great thing with Simon Pegg where he asks Simon Pegg what he always wanted for Christmas as a boy and after a long conversation basically gets implanted in his brain an elaborately detailed story that he wanted a red bike with a particular handle and seat and they bring it out and they're like well happy Merry Christmas uh, and he's like the reality is you didn't want that that is not a real story from your childhood I have it scripted here 
And I slowly got, and yet seeing that and hearing this, and I've seen like things about memory many times, I still don't believe it. I'm like, I wouldn't fall for it. Mm -hmm. Like everyone thinks they wouldn't fall for that. Yeah, but no, Michael, don't you, you remember said. that time you and I were together in India and you oh, fell very for well. it? Yeah, no, of course, yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth Loftus, like one of her experiments is what there's like a more reasonable one where she gets people to remember seeing Bugs Bunny at Disney World, even though Bugs Bunny's not a Disney property, and mm -hmm. so like they couldn't have seen him. But then there's one where she gets she's like, "Got you, idiot, <laughs> Loftus, <laughs> Loftus out." Uh, there's another one where she gets people to remember. Uh, going up in a hot air balloon, even though they've never been in a hot air Amazing. balloon before. That seems so objectively yeah, like, how quantifiable. The fuck can yes. you see? I'm learning this for the first time, and I'm not too scared because it sounds like it's just this person, Elizabeth Loftus, who's using this special power to f with people about Disneyland and balloons. But <laughs> should I be worried? Like, are cops and lawyers taking advantage of this? Do they? Did they know this before I did? And like, are like, I feel like is there a lawyer? Is there a lawyer that's like the best in the country at tricking people? Nowadays, what happens is you hire experts who then take the stand and then talk about how you can't rely on this expert on this excuse me on this eyewitness testimony. That's such a crazy evolution of trials that like I'm gonna bring up my witness who was there and is gonna tell you what happened. Okay, counter witness. My person is going to talk about how memory is a lie. Everything is bullshit. Right. You can't trust it. Yeah, just like a scientist comes up and is like, they didn't see any of that shit. Special surprise witness, philosopher who will explain why justice is uh, imaginary. Right? <laughs> it's not even a concept. Why are we here? They're just going to bring up David Blaine, who's going to be like, look, there's a card in your mouth. See, nothing's real. It's fine. <laughs> So we were talking about seeing this stuff in movies and TV and so on. And so really what it seems to me is, uh, is that you have writers who are perpetuating myths, and then you have viewers who never question the myths. And so then- Just shit on everyone in the room, Peter. Great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's also, I think, an interesting linked part of the equation, because we talked about like people on the stand, and authority seems to be, and there's a lot of studies about that I'd love to hear your take on, Peter, but how true is it Basically, like, my basic skim knowledge of psychology is that anyone will do anything if you're wearing a lab coat. Like that test where they have you shock someone in the yeah. other room, and if you're, like, in street clothes, most people eventually go, I'm not, no, I'm not gonna shock the person. And if you're the same guy in a lab coat, they'll be like, I'm sorry, sir, yes, they, are they dead yet? There's lots and lots of work that show that people in positions of authority does have an influence on how people behave that we do tend to follow. And if you think about it, you're raised to do that. Obey your teachers, obey this, you know. And so we're really just following a script that we learned really early on. This is a thing I've been sitting on for a while and I don't know what to do with it. It's one of the uh, least responsible and ethical things that I, uh, my middle school back in New Jersey has ever done. It was a school that was 6th, uh, 7th, and 8th grade, those three years, and the way the curriculum lined up, we were all learning about the Holocaust at the same time. The administration decided that one day they would pick a minority of uh, students and make them wear green badges and call them greenies and actively <laughs> encouraged anyone who wasn't a greenie to be mean to and exclude the greenies. You were a greenie. I was a greenie. Yeah. <laughs> because the story can't be, I wasn't a greenie, I was a Nazi, and I loved it. Like, that's a bad story. It can't be that. They, so I wore a green badge for a day, and we were forced to sit together. All the greenies were stuck together in classes and at lunch, and students were throwing forks and food at greenies and like, get out of here, greenies! The way that I'm, I mean, no. It's not your I mean, fault, I'm, Thank you. <laughs> Jack, I, I asked if any filthy greenies were gonna be on the panel, and you told me no. And I don't, I don't understand why this experiment was conducted because you're not gonna learn anything when you tell a 13 year old who's like furiously horny and doesn't know what to do with his body, hey, just for today, you could be mean to anyone who's got this thing. And uh, they're gonna learn, that feels good. And the rest of us like, the next day, it was like, all right, what did everyone learn? It's like, yeah, on behalf of the Greenies, I think it would have been tough being Jewish during the Holocaust. <laughs> I already thought that. But thanks for teaching me that and we're, my friend Joe, whom I used to play basketball with, is like a green sticker away from throwing knives at me. <laughs> and was Joe like, actually my position softened a little now that I... So, so what do I do with that information? Uh, 
So I, this comes up in movies all the time, is any sort of drama that involves a psychiatrist or a therapist is you have to talk through your childhood problems. And, you know, really the best thing you can do is get, move on from it. Revisiting these things and going back and, and, and looking at them constantly continues to upset you. One of the best coping mechanisms is to say, oh, things have changed. That's, that was me when I was a kid. I've moved on. And like there's this idea of talking I through all no these things. I no more. <laughs> That's actually, I mean, I mean, we had a lot of fun here today. That's a, <laughs> that's a true thing because that is so, uh, every movie and TV show psychiatrist or therapist is like, get, get down into your family, figure out what thing happened when you were a child. What's I mean, your, what's yeah. your rose bed, rosebud sled? And you're saying, movies well, lied to me? I should be careful because I only have 1% of Frasier's training. <laughs> um, you're basically Niles then. But, well, I guess... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm basing a lot of this off, off of um, work on what's called affect regulation. How do people cope with bad circumstances in their life, bad situations, negative emotions? Usually, like, focusing a lot on the cause of those negative emotions is not a great way to deal with negative emotions. There's lots of other great ways to do it, and so in that way, I'm making a case for why. Yeah, one that I really definitely wanted to get to that I've always, I believed was true, just because it seems so plausible, is, like, if you're angry, like, punch a pillow. Yeah. And then I was like, that, sound, that seems to makes sense you exhaust yourself in a harmless way a couple of years ago someone pointed out actually you sort of get in the habit of doing the things you routinely do so setting aside time to actively focus on your anger is likely to make you sort of addicted to having sessions of anger i was like that also sounds true <laughs> what do i punch peter <laughs> wow that's a hard one so did you know when you came on this podcast that you're gonna help us work through all of our <laughs> I, I think it's we about time. About Let's movies. get my dad out here, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we got some to work out. So certainly su trying to suppress negative emotions backfires. And then certainly acting on anger is, pro is not a great way to deal with anger. What I think the average person doesn't realize, but does oftentimes, is they have a whole menu of things that you can do to deal with, let's say, anger. So there's things like reappraising the thing that, you know, the situation that made you angry. So if it's here in LA, it's driving. Is it then taking a more kind perspective on the person who just cut you off, right? So that's one way to, to you alleviate the thing that makes that has made you unhappy. Is it um, distraction, you know, or is it that you do something enjoyable, right? You know, there's so there's actually a whole bunch of different things that you can do when faced with negative emotions. Meditation is a real, actually a really great way to, because it basically removes thoughts from your mind. Probably after you get where you're driving, right? You don't want yeah. to like just <laughs> right. go directly into the meditation. One of the things is like nothing seems as important as it is while you're thinking about it, right? So while you're thinking about something, every that seems like the most important thing in the world. So one of the best coping mechanisms is just to think about something else. Because emotions are connected to things. What ends up happening is there's a situation that creates a negative emotion, and then that thing goes away, and then the question becomes, does this negative emotion become a mood? So, Kitty Genovese... Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that'll perk the podcast right up. Yeah. Yes, multiple stabbing victim, Kitty Genovese. <laughs> Do we have a clip? <laughs> <laughs> Two synopsis, just in case. Poor woman named Kitty Genovese or Genovese stabbed outside her apartment building. The legend of the case study, and that's what I don't even know if it's actually accurate, is that many people witnessed the stabbing from their windows. No one called the police. And I believe the thesis they gathered, or maybe they gathered multiple things from that. Everyone thought someone else would call the police, right? And there's this diffusion effect of, if you live in a society, especially society where you literally see other people around you, you're like, well, society will take care of it. And that we're all monsters, I guess. And that's, that's, <laughs> been, that's been debunked? or well, is so, the still, what uh, I've heard controversy about it on both sides. Right, so. a lot of people did call the cops. Uh, and the debunking story that I read was like, some people did call the cops and others yelled at the attacker out the window. I was like, that's not enough. <laughs> that's not, that doesn't make me feel better. You better stop. Hey, leave her alone. He didn't, he didn't do it. He's still oh, doing it. Something's on TV. Get out of here, you greenie. <laughs> Like Dan a, was just walking by. That was unreal. It seems like it's a true uh, effect. I think they've proven that this actually happens in laboratory settings, and this story was just an exaggerated story. Yeah. So I think what ha yeah what happens um, I think it often happens. Uh, you know, psychologists they notice things in the world and they say, oh that 
That's something I should study that. Why does that happen? So the Kitty Genovese story led to a whole series of, of studies about diffusion of responsibility and how this notion of the more people who are present in a, in a time of crisis, in a moment of crisis, the less the likelihood that any one person will step up. So basically, if you have a heart attack, the best situation to be in is to have one person there because the person has to do something about it. As you start adding people, then the likelihood that so any one person's going to, to act goes down in that way. I'd love to see the one instance where they just had two and they're like, you do it, you take care of them. I don't wanna do it. So the best science does, I think, the following things is that it takes what we already know about human behavior and then builds a theory about why it is the case that this, for instance, diffusion of responsibility will, um, will occur. Real world observations come first. You, you see something and you think it's a theory and then you test it. I've done both where I've kind of noticed something in the world and say, ah, you know, like that seems, that's strange, that's peculiar. But then I've also used theories to make new, new predictions. But I think mostly it's folks who just sort of know humans really well, is going, wait, that's weird. There was something that came out recently about why people look like their dogs. That study comes from like people going to the dog part and like, you know, you know, Jerry looks like his dog and, and Jane looks like her dog. Like, why is that kind of a thing? And like, I mean, it has to do with- Tell us, what did they find out? <laughs> I, I actually, I think I know the answer to it. I can, first I can tell you how you go about trying to find that out, right? Like, you know, so for instance, you, you give people a choice of, you give them pictures of dogs and say, which of these dogs would you choose? Then you show pictures of the people and the dogs to other folks and rate how similar they are to find out like, for instance, do people, are they drawn to dogs that look like them? And what is it about the looks that are the same? And I think it has to do with the eyes. Like the eyes. Someone Google ratio. that. I'm not <laughs> sure that's true, but that's my vague recollection. That's what I love all. about these studies, too, is psychology is so re rooted in the real world that the studies will involve whatever, like mothers being able to identify ba their baby by the cry amongst other babies crying. And there's the one where it's like a series of people sniff the underarms of worn shirts and try to identify which one is their significant other. So I just love that psychology experiments could literally be like, you take the five bucks, you walk in, and they're like, start smashing these grapes with that hammer. Yeah. <laughs> Why? It you, doesn't matter. We're you, gonna know so something. You really it. like you really like the idea of a probably stoned 20-year-old walking into a room for five dollars and they're like, which one of these dogs looks like which one of these people? And they're just like, fuck it. This two. <laughs> well, see, I love because I was a poor student and I'd be like, this I can do. <laughs> this. <laughs> you say it's so, probably stoned, but I really do feel like that is a hidden bias in the experiments because it's not just that they're college students, it's that they're college students who are bored enough to yeah. be like, yeah, I want to do this. And like somebody actually came out from the Stanford prison experiment, which uh, we haven't talked about yet, but is total bullshit. Hold on, Jack. Uh, Did we just get a woo from yeah, the audience? Yeah, Stanford prison experiment. <laughs> on the Stanford experiment prison. <laughs> what, that what proved the... at least to pop culture that man can be made into a hateful right. war machine. What, yeah. One of the Very guards popular. came out later and was like, first of all, the guy who organized it was like stage directing us the whole time. He was like, so what we're going to want to do is just think about it as you're all powerful and they're weak. And like it, that, that was the guy running the experiment. So like they knew exactly what uh, he wanted them to do. But the guy who like wrote about it 20 years later was like, and I was stoned the whole time. I like brought joints in, like gave them to the prisoners. And so like everybody was just This is why my job home. is so difficult. Right. <laughs> Colorado Boulder. Wait, I can't cause you're imagine. stoned all the time? <laughs> I find myself defending science over here, but I'll, I'll do it again. So, um, Boo. but no. I but, mean, I feel the same way. This table is the science table. <laughs> We're under attack tonight. All right, we have not debunked that many uh, myths, so we're gonna do a lightning round. You just nice. say myth or not. Uh, <laughs> Big we fun. asked you to bring a gong and a bell. Did you bring those? <laughs> uh, five stages of grief? Uh, no. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, There's way more stages, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> they happen all at the same time sometimes, you know, right. the whole thing. They don't happen in order, and also the original study was done by a woman describing people accepting their own death, but somehow it got transposed over to people like any getting grief, through. Like any grief, like any trauma, the death exactly. of a loved one, yeah. Right. Your dog doesn't look as much like you as you would have liked. <laughs> uh, the Mozart effect that you play Mozart for 
children. Oh, oh like unborn babies? Smart. Yeah. Mozart did improve uh, the children, like you said. Uh, Blur was better. The band Blur did better. Uh, so it's just, it's just like any sort of stimulation. What if I play my kid Limp Bizkit in the womb? What happens then? They stay. They refuse to come yeah. out of the world. <laughs> uh, cult members are stupid, gullible sheep. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, as a representative of, of uh, science table, I think uh, sheep and people are like a totally different thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. That is, that is right. Uh, a theory that compelled me was like, the more intelligent you are, you'd think that means the better you are at seeing truth, but the reality is that the more able you are to build any kind of structure that you yeah. want to defend the beliefs right. that you choose to believe. You're, you're right. There's actually been work on this. It's called motivated reasoning. This is actually, for me, as a psychologist, one of the most fascinating things is that if you want something to be, if you believe something, you're incredibly good at attacking ideas that go against it and very good at making reasons for why this is the case and so in that way more intelligent people are better at motivated reasoning and so they they actually are harder to persuade with actual sometimes facts and so on when they have a a, a belief that they that they already exist so you're, you nailed that you should have you thought about joining what, a phd you program want, you want to join the should science I swap table? tables yeah, yeah. 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 Jack on his uh, subliminal messages like in Fight Club when he like has the single frame uh, yeah. of a dick and right. the kids start crying. Like how on our show, how we always mind. cut in the sound of a dick very right. briefly. <laughs> right. I, do wanna, I, I need to pause again briefly because in the same way that you said stand for prison experiment and someone went woo, as soon as you said single frame of dick, someone in the audience went nah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no evidence that subliminal messaging works. Actually, the, the scary thing is, is not the subliminal stuff, it's the, what they call supraliminal stuff. It's actually the stuff around us all the time, the Nike swusses and all the advertising and all that kind of stuff. That stuff does work. Right. That is, seeing a Nike swoosh over and over again actually makes you like Nike more. Uh, electroshock treatment is a savage, primitive treatment. It sounds that way, but I don't, I'm not, so, not so much. Right. Yeah, not so Yeah, much. it's so. actually like still used, and I don't know. I, having seen One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, yeah. I was like, why would you do that to somebody? And like, doesn't it like just make him like into a vegetable? Yeah. He like gets shocked. No, the the shock from the movie anyway. The shocking doesn't do anything to him, but they they do like a, a lobotomy uh, to him. They, that's oh, what oh, turns so. him to yeah. That's to also a harmless. That yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, we only use ten percent of our brain, so you can right. take a lot out. Oh of my god. <laughs> I'd like to try to end on a little bit more of a positive note, if we can. <laughs> Only because, like, you know, obviously we're talking about debunking myths and so on in this way, but I do think that this kind of thing is actually a very healthy thing to do. But what ends up happening is the kind of classic two steps forward, one step back kind of thing. And when you look at how far we've come as a society due to science, we can make a pretty good case for science, right? So whether it be vaccinations or you know, just understanding depression and, you know, and actually I think this, uh, the notion about the work that's being done with eyewitness testimony, in the long run, you know, it's sort of, it, it's sort of upsetting to think that we're not as good at this thing and that we have systems of justice built around it. But if, if it, you know, if done well, eventually it'll make our lives better, right? Safer and more efficient and happier and, and so on in that kind of way. And so the problem with science is that it's messy and it's slow, but I do believe that eventually, you know, it wins out in that, in that way. I find it reassuring how easy it is to get away with murder. I think that's, <laughs> that's good news for me. Uh, this was almost such a positive note. <laughs> It, but it wasn't funny, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you guys for coming out. I appreciate it. D Dan, did you have something? I, I was going to do a bit about getting hit in the head. If you get hit in the head, we know that it won't jog your memory, but would it uh, trans transform you into an Italian sports car driver? It was a, I was considering not doing it, because that's like a deep-cut Flintstones joke. Yeah. <laughs> what the f***? But you asked me if I had anything well, to say. And that's the scientific consensus from Table Science. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone.